Hello and welcome to Edexcel IGCSE Computer Science Paper 1. This is 2022 predictions based on the advanced information that came out in February. So we're looking at past paper questions now based on that. Now, this video is for entertainment purposes only. I cannot recommend that you only advise what's in the advanced information. You do need to understand the whole of the specification. For example, logic gates are not in the advanced information, whereas they are in the specification, but you never know, they could come up in paper two. So this is for paper one only, we cannot predict what's in paper two. I am not an Edexcel examiner, I do not have the 2022 paper yet, I only have that when the exam has been done, so do not ask me for it. This is for entertainment purposes only, and to help you guide your revision. So this is the advanced information 2022 and as soon as it came out in February, I linked it in the community, but I'll also link it down in the description along with all the papers that I'm using today will also be linked down in the description to my Dropbox account. So with that out of the way, let's get started. So this is section one and looking at algorithms, decomposition and abstraction. So what you need to understand in this unit is how to write pseudocode, how to read pseudocode, how to write flowcharts, how to read flowcharts, how to trace them. And we can see that there's some sections that are missing. So we can see 1.1.2, but we can see 1.1.3 and 1.1.4 is missing. We can also see 1.1.6, 1.1.7, and interestingly, 1.1.8. So no searching and sorting, no bubble sort, no merge sort, no sorting algorithms are in there. That's not to say they couldn't be in paper two as a programming question, but they're not in paper one. So that's also missing. There's also missing 1.1.9, fitness for purpose. So one we're gonna look at now is 1.1.5, identify and correct al errors in algorithms. And I've got a question for you for this, including trace tables. There are a couple of questions in past papers that cover this area. So correcting errors. So we'll go and look at one now. And the question that we're going to look at is 2021 question 5b. So here is 5b. We've got an algorithm written using pseudocode. The algorithm should display the average of the numbers that have been input. So you can see you set up your variables there, set total to zero, number to zero, count to zero. And you've got a while loop, while number not equal to negative one, do. So what happens is the user inputs some numbers, it adds to the count. At the end, it's gonna add the numbers, it's gonna total up the count, and it's gonna divide the total of the numbers by the count. So to quit the program, to stop entering numbers, the user enters negative one. But Isaac uses input two, three, five, two, and negative one to test the algorithm. So negative one should stop the algorithm. He discovers an error. The average is 2.75 expected the actual is 2.2 so we need to explain why the actual is not the expected and also what line has been the error in and how to correct that error so what has happened here is you add the numbers up and you add negative one as well and then you're supposed to divide that by four but you divide by five and end up with 2.2 not 2.75 if you divide it by four so that is the issue there. The count, this, the count has been incremented too many times. It should stop the count at four, but it doesn't. It stops the count at five, and that's why we've got the wrong result. So the reason that we've got 2.2 instead of 2.75 is we divide the whole lot by five and not four. So where do we see that error? Where has he gone wrong with this? Well, we're looking for the easiest fix here. And what we really need to do is change line 10. So we need to set average to total divided by count minus one. So the line number that contains the error is line 10. So what we need to do is subtract one from the count. So we can do line 10, set average to total divided by count and then subtract one from the count in brackets so it works. And then we get the expected result. We divide by four instead of five. So that is exactly the kind of question you'll get this summer where you have an algorithm that doesn't work or it produces an unexpected outcome. So it's likely to be, if we think of the types of errors that you can have, it's likely to be a logical error, 
this is a logical error here. So if we're asked to describe what kind of error this is, it's a logical error. The program works, and the hardest to find because the program actually works. The program's working fine, but it's not producing the intended outcome. Okay, so we move on to topic three. This is binary numbers. So binary numbers very much going to be part of your exam. Binary numbers up to 255, which is eight bits or one byte. I cannot see mention of hexadecimal in here, so I think I would leave that. But you're definitely going to have to convert binary numbers into decimal and decimal into binary and understand how binary is used to represent numbers, text, sounds and graphics. You're also going to need to understand sign and magnitude. So remember, when it says assigned question, assigned number, you're looking at the most significant bit on the left hand side, the 128. You're not adding that. Is that a one or a zero? If it's a zero, it's a positive. If it's a one, it's a negative number. And you do not add that when you're converting it to decimal. It's going to be a negative number. You also need to do binary arithmetic to add numbers. So zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. One plus zero is one. One plus one is one zero. One plus one plus one is one one. And remember when doing that, it's column addition and you need to do carries across. So remember how to do that. It should not go into the ninth bit when you're adding if it goes into the ninth bit is called an overflow and that's an error you also need to understand ascii unicode you need to look at bitmap images you need to understand how sound is represented and we're looking at compression lossy versus lossless so lossless is when we don't lose any data on compression losses is when we do lose data on compression cannot get it back understand that file storage is made in, measured in bytes and be able to calculate file sizes. So no hexadecimal, but please ensure you can convert though. I wouldn't, i definitely just quickly go over that again to make sure you do understand that. And if you're doing A-level computer science, you're gonna to need to understand that anyway. So we'll look at some exam questions now. We'll start with 2019 question three. So this is question E here. This is three E, information sent across networks is represented in bit patterns. So that's the ones and zeros in eight bits the bit pattern there uses sign and magnitude representation convert this bit pattern to a denary number and when you're doing this conversion you could easily get it wrong you could add up the most significant bit so let's go through this now how we do this so look here i've written down my place values there 128 down to one so you need to memorize these you need to be able to draw these out and what i'm going to do is put the bit pattern in there and look at how we convert that to a denary number so there i've placed my bit pattern into the place values there just be careful that you do get them in the correct columns otherwise you're going to have problems so what i'm looking at now is i'm going to ignore the most significant bit so i just placed an x there um, i wouldn't recommend that in exam but just place something to remind yourself not to do the addition so we need to do 64 plus 16 which is 80 plus one remember you've got to do this in the head it's non-calculator so it's 80 81 now because i've got one in place value 128 the most significant bit i haven't added that i need to look at that it's a one so that represents a negative number so the correct answer here is negative 81 it's negative 81 so it's not 128 plus 64 plus 16 plus one it's negative 81 it's 64 plus 16 plus 1 ignoring that most significant bit until it comes to look at it and say is it a positive or negative number it's probably likely to be a negative number in your exam the correct answer is negative 81 so make sure you can do that now you need to understand ascii and unicode what ascii and unicode is is representations bit patterns of letters on keyboards letters so capital letter a has decimal number 65 and its binary number is zero one zero 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 one which represents capital letter a lowercase letter a will have its own different number so every letter on the keyboard can be represented with ascii with ascii we have 127 plus plus the null character so it's 128 characters to represent with extended ascii it's 256 including null character with Unicode, we can represent even more. So we can represent Chinese, Arabic, 
Japanese characters, etc., which is a limitation of ASCII because we cannot represent those letters, those alphabets. So you need to understand that every single letter has a bit pattern. So we're going to look at an exam question now, 2020 paper, paper one, question four. So this is a sound sampling question, and it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get one of these in your exam. What we've got is a sound wave here represented with the dotted line and the square line with dots represents the samples. So line A there represents the samples and line B represents the actual sound wave there. So three, give the sampling frequency including the correct units, you need to count the dots. So along the X axis is time, along the Y axis is amplitude, they're important. So along the X axis, we can see time there, zero, one second, two seconds. What can we see? We can see one, two dots per second. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, so the frequency is number of samples per second. So we can see here, that we've got two samples per second, and in the correct unit, that is two hertz. So samples are measured in hertz, number of samples per second. There are two samples per second, so the frequency is two hertz. It must be in hertz or kilohertz, okay? Kilohertz is times by a thousand. So two hertz isn't actually that many samples per second. Give one impact of increasing the sampling frequency. If I sample more, then I'm going to increase the sound quality because I'll be taking more samples. The sound will sound more realistic. So for this question, I've wrote, I'll increase the sound quality through taking more samples, but I'll also increase the file size. You only need one of those. You don't need both. That's too much for that. You're going to increase the file size, but you're also going to increase the quality. So what this is, if we go back to look at this, what this process is, is quantization. So what we're doing is We've measured the sound wave at different points. We've taken samples per second. Those samples are numbers. They're converted, they're quantized, they're converted into binary, and that gives our analog to digital conversion process. So we measure the sound wave, we take samples per second, so many samples per second, we convert those into binary, and that is my process. And that is how analog sound is stored digitally. So five, the bit depth measures the resolution of the sound sample. State the minimum bit depth needed to store the sound sampled in figure three. Justify your answer. Okay, so if we go back and look at this, you can see amplitude goes up to six. Okay, so how many bits? We need the minimum now, so we cannot say four, because that's too many. So we think about, we need to store possibly up to seven values there. So we need three bits, okay? Think about how these numbers are represented. So eight in binary is zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. Whereas that's too many. So that's four bits, that's too many. Whereas seven, if we think about it, is one, 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 six is one, one, zero, five is one, zero, one, etc. all the way through. So the minimum we need is three bits. Give the binary value of the audio stored in sample at the fourth second. So we look at the fourth second there, it's five. So we need to represent five. In binary, it's one, zero, one, or zero, one, zero, one. You need to do it in four bits. Don't bother doing it in eight, it's just four bits. Let's go and look at this. This is a calculation. So you're gonna have a question like this in your exam. We'll go through this very, very carefully. Ibrahim wants to store a music file. Sampling frequency is 47 kilohertz, a bit depth is 64. The analog signal lasts for 819 seconds. Construct an expression to show how file size in bytes is calculated. You do not need to do the calculation. So to work this out, it's rate times resolution times number of seconds. So we've got there the rate, which is 47 kilohertz. So it's actually 47,000 samples per second. 47 kilohertz is 47,000 samples per second. So it needs to be 47,000 multiplied by the resolution, the bit depth is 64, multiplied by the time in seconds. It needs to be in seconds. If that was in minutes, you'd need to convert that to seconds. 
So if that said three minutes, it would need to convert that to seconds, which would be 180, for example, but it's 819. So we need to do that multiplication. Then we do not need to do the calculation. Now, it's 47,000 times 64 times 819. So that will gain you three marks. You need to divide it by eight. Why? Because it's got to be in bytes. So we divide it by eight. There's eight bits in a byte. We need to divide it by eight to get it into bytes. If it was in, if it was in kilobytes, we divide it then by a thousand. Kibby bytes by a thousand and twenty-four. So that is four marks. That is how to do a file size calculation. You need to do that in your exam and you don't need to work it out. There's no calculator. I would suggest to really practice these and have a go at many of these because it's guaranteed you're going to get this question in your exam. I guarantee it. So let's have another look at this and we'll look at 2021 November question 1b. So this is images now. Images are stored as binary data. Yes, a bitmap image is 400 by 200. Color depth of 12 bits, so it uses 12 bits to store the values. So it can represent quite a lot of colors with 12 bits. Construct an expression to show how the image in bytes is calculated. So it's important thing to note there is it's in bytes. Now I've done 400 times 200 times 12. Now that would give me one mark, but I need it in bytes. So I need to divide the whole lot by eight. So remember there's eight bits in a byte. I need to divide the whole lot by eight. So these aren't difficult. You can do these, they're not difficult. It's just multiplication, the correct multiplication. And if it needs to be in bytes, divide by eight. If it needs to be in kilobytes, divide by a thousand. Megabytes by a thousand, squared, etc. Remember, if it's kibby bytes, it's 1,024. So as long as you remember that in your exam, you'll be you'll have absolutely no problem with these questions at all. They're not, you do not need to do the calculation. Okay, encryption is not in the pre-release, but having said that, it could be in paper too. So you could get an exam question that gets you to do some encryption. I have seen that in past paper questions, you never know, you could have a exam question that you need to write some kind of encryption program or you need to go through that. So make sure you do understand encryption methods. It isn't going to be in paper one, but I would have thought it could be in paper two. There's a very strong chance that it could be in paper two. So make sure you understand the different encryption methods, Visionaire, Caesar Cipher, etc. For some help and guidance with that, I suggest you go back and look at some of the past paper twos. Okay, 2020, for example, could be quite useful. So it's not in your paper one coming up soon, but it will be probably in paper two. Section four, machines and computational models. Understand that there is a range of computational models, sequential, parallel, and multi-agent. So sequential, a sequential compute, computational model is one in which instructions are executed one after another. There may be branches in the program, but the general principle is that each instruction follows on from the previous one. Python programs are sequential. Parallel. Parallel computational model is one in which each program instruction is in executed simultaneously on multiple processors in order to get results faster. Using multi-cores in processors, so think of dual-core, quad-core, as an example of parallel computing. It's by using parallel processing that supercomputers are getting faster and faster. Multi-agent. Multi-agent computational model is one in which computer systems cooperate and coordinate with other agents to achieve their goals. Swarm robots are examples of multi-agents. So make sure you understand the difference between that. Sequential, parallel, and multi-agent. That's definitely in the exam. So moving on, 4.2 hardware. So quite a lot in here, not a lot really taken out so you definitely understand the difference between ram and rom so their main memory ram random access memory volatile rom non-volatile ram is used to store temporary instructions rom is used to store bios data mainly in in a standard pc you need to understand the pro concept of the store program so concepts of cpu the clock the FDE cycle von Neumann model input process output. So store program concept, data and instructions. Understand the factors that affect the performance of the CPU. Understand how data is stored on a physical device. Understand the concept of storing in the cloud. Programming languages. 
So low level versus high level, we'll go through that in a minute. Logic is not in, but it could be in paper too, so make sure you understand and or not, but you will not get a logic question in paper one. There will be no logic question. So let's look at some exam questions now. We'll start with 2021 question 4D, and then we'll do 2020 question three. Okay, a classic question now. D, von Neumann developed the stored program concept. Describe the stored program concept. What is it in a nutshell? Data and instructions are stored in main memory. On two, the fetch, decode, execute cycle is a cycle central processing unit follows in order to process instructions. Name two registers used in the cycle, program counter or PC and memory address register MAR. It's also others you can have there as well. Three, describe the role of the address bus and the data bus during the fetch part of the cycle. Think about what that means. Address is the address of the instruction on the address bus, okay, in main memory, the address in main memory. Contents of that address are carried on the data bus. So address carries the address, data carries the data. So what happens if we increase the width of a bus? What happens if we increase the width of the data bus? We can carry more data. What happens if we increase the width of the address bus? Well, logically, we think it through. Just think it through logically. If I increase the address bus, I've got more addresses. I've got more, I've got more memory addresses that can be accessed. So let's look at another one there. This is 2020 question three. Um, here's the CPU. It's partially completed diagram showing the fetch, decode, execute cycle hardware components in there. Complete the diagram by labeling the buses adding the directional arrows to the dotted line show the flow of communication. So you've got one, two, three there, and then you see the dotted lines, that's four, five, and six marks that you're gonna be getting for this. Okay, what are the three buses? We'll start. So the first one is the address bus, that comes first. Then underneath that, you've got the data bus. Then underneath that, you've got the control bus. So it's A, D, C, that's three marks. So now I think this is the easy bit labeling the arrows here. So to do this, we need to think about input process output. Okay, so we can see input and output there. So input would be keyboard, output would be display. So we'll actually start here with the RAM. Now we notice that the keyboard control and display controller all have arrowheads pointing up. So it's a fairly good guess that the arrowhead here is gonna be pointing up. So that is actually an arrow pointing up. That's the best I could do with this fill and sign. That actually is pointing up there. Let's look at the keyboard controller. So we can see double headed arrows there and there on display and on this one here. Okay, so it's a fairly good bet that this is probably gonna be a double headed arrow here. So they represent double headed arrows. Now, look at the display here. Um, keyboard goes in, display is out. So the arrowhead needs to go there on that one, okay? So that's what you need to do. And that is your six marks for that question. Let's look at B before we move on. The CPU includes, includes an area of cache memory. Increasing the size of cache will improve the performance of the CPU. Explain how increasing the size of the cache improves the performance. Well, cache stores frequently used instructions. It's closer to the CPU than RAM. So therefore increasing the size of the cache will increase the performance because instructions are close to the CPU, close to hand. It doesn't have to go as far to get them. So they'll be closer, closer to hand, or easily accessed, more quickly accessed. Okay, 4.5 programming language. It's high versus low level. Low level is machine code and assembly. You need to memorize that. High level is Python, Java, etc., C Sharp, etc. Low level, program the CPU directly, either through machine code or through assembler. No translation is needed. And positives of that are it's a direct translation. It's quick for the CPU. You don't need to compile or interpret it. Negatives are, it's a lot harder to program. It's a lot harder to read than programming languages. High level translation is needed. So this is Python, for example, either via compiler or interpreter. Python uses interpreter. It interprets your code line by line. So when you get an error message, you can tell where the error is because it's interpreting it line by line. A compiler creates an executable file of the code and you cannot see the code when finished. So interpreter is slightly quicker at the start, whereas compiler, once it's done, it's gonna be quicker because you're just running the executable file. Make sure you understand that. 
programming language is high versus low level. That is definitely going to be in your exam. Okay, topic five, networks. We see it's quite a bit of stuff missing here, 5.1, but you do need to understand PANs, LANs and WANs, network topologies, ring and mesh. PANs, LANs and WANs, PAN, personal area network, Bluetooth connection, LAN, local area network, within a building, WAN, wide area network, the internet. Topologies, ring and mesh. Here's the ring topology. Data is unidirectional. It flows unidirectionally, flows one way around the ring. Okay, positives of that are it's fairly easy to set up, easy to add computers. Negatives, if the network breaks, if the ring breaks, if a computer goes down, then the whole network goes down. Mesh topology literally looks like a mesh. All computers connected together. So you can imagine that positives of that are data Communication is very, very fast. Data moves very, very quickly throughout the mesh network. You can also imagine the negatives of that, how much cabling is needed. It's incredibly complex and a lot of cabling is needed. It's going to be very expensive to set up. Network security, to make sure you understand cyber attack. Phishing, phishing emails, attempting to gain information. So we're from your bank. Please click this link to enter your data. Okay, and they're going to steal your data. That's a phishing attempt. They're phishing for data with a pH. Farming is redirection of a website. So you think you're going onto a Facebook website, you're not. It's actually a bogus website, a dummy website. And what's going to happen is they're going to steal your data. They're going to steal your password and your login so they can gain access to your account. Shouldering is looking over someone's shoulder. Now, it doesn't necessarily physically mean looking over your shoulder at the, at the cash point. It could be a camera installed, or it could be a camera installed at, at when you enter your PIN at the cash point, at the cash desk when you go and pay for your petrol, for example, you enter your PIN number. There could be a camera installed above that, so they're reading the card, and there's also a camera looking at, your, at you entering your PIN number. That's also an example of shouldering. How do we get around shouldering? Well, we monitor our, usually we have things at cash points, for example, mirrors. Um, also, when using our laptop, we can angle it away from cameras and things like that so people can't see our passwords. Social engineering is manipulation to get people to diverge information. So maybe an invented story. So I'm stuck abroad. Um, can you please help me? Or it could be a catfishing scam where people I think they're speaking to someone, a potential partner but actually the person isn't who they say they are they're just trying to gain money or gain information gain data to still steal money it's usually for financial gain audit trails so audit trails can provide a sequence of activities events that are stored so they can be used in if we need to in security to find out what's happening so that's an audit trail where we can provide evidence of a sequence of activities so let's look at some security exam questions, 2020 question one and 2019 question two. So you could start off with a question like this, why are computers connected in a network? They're connected in a network to share data and also share resources. So for two marks there to share data, maybe to share an internet connection for the other mark or to share resources like printers for the other mark as well. So you need two separate things for two marks there. You have two advantages of wired versus wireless, wired network, is better than wires because it's going to be more secure and faster. Disadvantages of wired versus wireless. Disadvantages that you need more cabling, you need more expertise to install it. It's also a trip hazard. It also limits where you can work. So if you've got a wired connection to desktop, for example, you can only work in that space. Whereas with wireless, as long as you're within range, you can work wherever you want to. This is an interesting question here that you could get this summer difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. The internet is a network. The World Wide Web are the web pages. They're not the same thing. Make sure you understand the difference. And then finally, we'll look at this one. Why was IPv6 introduced? Because we needed more IP addresses. We're running out of IPv4 addresses, addresses. So IPv6 was introduced to give us more addresses. This is an interesting question because there's definitely in the advanced information stuff about the cloud, you need to understand the cloud. The cloud is somebody else's server. So think about what is the cloud while when I save my files to OneDrive, 
Google Drive, I'm saving to the cloud. You accessing these exam papers via Dropbox, that's the cloud. The cloud is someone else's server, okay? I'm not storing it on my server, I'm storing it on the cloud, it's someone else's server. So areas of responsibility on the cloud, okay? Documents. Zaffer needs to provide decent password. So his responsibility of storing documents is to provide decent password and to use the two-step verification. So Zaffa is the client, the cloud storage provider is server, client server. The client's responsible for their password, decent password, letters and numbers, at least eight characters and the cloud storage provider should back up files and provide an adequate level of protection for the server. Let's look at three domain name servers. Domain name servers are basically like a phone book for the internet. They convert the URL, e.g. www.pearson.com into an IP address. So here we're given a question that asks us about that. Domain name server is used in the process, DNS server, identify the input to and output from the domain name server. Okay, so what Zafra has done is typed in www.pearson.com into his browser there. So what is the input and what is the output from that? So the input to the domain name server is www.pearson.com. That is what Zaffa has typed into his URL. And the output there, Pearson's machine, is the IPv4 address. So that's been converted into the IPv4 address. And that is 2.20 point, scroll down, I just need to go and look back up, 0.38.113. And that is the correct answer. So what the domain name server has done is converted that www.pearson.com into the IP address and that's the role of the domain name server. So let's be clear about that. The internet and the World Wide Web are two different things. The internet is a network, the World Wide Web are the web pages that use the network. DNS, domain name server, is the phone book of the internet, converts URLs into IP addresses. I'm going to look at one more exam question, 2019 question two. So in your exam, if you're given a question like this, Domain name server, what is it doing? Is it's converting the URL into an IP address. Okay, so that is that Pearson's end, the IP address, IPv4 address. So it's converted that www.pearson.com into an IPv4 address. So we'll wrap this section up, just some of the things there. Penetration testing, for example, identifying security vulner vulnerabilities. So you might employ someone to do some penetration testing. We saw a question like that in the 2021, November 2021. What is penetration testing? It's where someone literally storms the system to find the weak points, okay? To literally find checks all around the system to find the weak points and they're paid to do that. So that hacker is not gonna do that, okay? Finish things off. So 5.3.2, World Wide Web, components of the World Wide Web, so web server URLs, www.pearson.com, URL, URL is Uniform Resource Locator, okay. ISP is Internet Service Provider, who provides your internet. HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and HTTPS, S is Secure, Secure version of that, to provide us with our web pages there, the protocol, and HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, the language of the web page. So if you look at the source of a web page, you'll see the language of it in HTML. That's how we create the web page. What your browser is doing is converting that HTML into a web page. So think about when you run your Python program, press F5, it's converting it into a program. That's pretty much what your browser is doing with the HTML. So that completes topic five. And that's everything that's going to be in your unit, in your paper one exam. So topic six now, this is the last topic, emerging trends, issues and impacts. This is where you're gonna get your six mark questions and it's gonna be quite interesting. There's a big thing on AI here, artificial intelligence and emerging trends, and also something on privacy and inclusion. So I'm gonna look at the AI section now. We're gonna do 2019 question 6C. So this is it, artificial intelligence, AI, in many forms has an increasing impact on our lives. Discuss this statement considering characteristics, uses and ethical issues of AI. So there's three areas we need to discuss and you must read the question very, very carefully. We must discuss characteristics, 
uses and ethical issues. So anything other than that is going off topic and it's not going to gain you any marks. So we start with the characteristics. I'm making it really clear to the examiner. I'm putting the heading, the characteristics. I'm going to make it really clear to the examiner what I'm doing now. So AI is programmed. It's implemented in software and it learns by identifying patterns and data. And that should be and will learn from the data to make predictions. So it'll make predictions. So it can learn from input. Algorithms may incorporate an element of self-improvement. So an example of this would be GPT-3, which uses deep learning to produce human-like text. It is a very, very clever algorithm and is used in a lot of AI now. I'm going to link down in the description a video, Cold Fusion, where he discusses uses of the GPT and AI. It's definitely worth a watch. It's going to be worth a watch for your exam to get you ready for an AI question that you're going to have in topic six. So you can expect an exact question like this in your topic six for paper one this summer. So uses of it, game playing, role play, logistics, etc. So make sure you can describe some uses of AI. And you probably use AI when you, you might play games on the computer. You might use AI there as well. Um, definitely, if it, definitely, if you've got some kind of home assistant system, like Alexa, for example, you'll be using AI. It will learn from you every time you use it. It will learn your preferences, what you like, it will learn your music tastes, etc. To some extent, if you think about things like Spotify, every time you create playlists or you play certain tracks, it's learning from you and it will generate tracks based on that or generate playlists based on that so ai is everywhere it's, it's learning from you it's learning your preferences your tastes for example so make sure you can describe some uses of ai and there's plenty out there these days so last thing we're going to discuss is ethical issues so one thing we can always refer to is job losses for example ai could result in job losses certain jobs not needed and um, virtual assistants can result in job losses absolutely with ai that's that's definite possibility trust in ai can we trust it what about life or death decisions can we trust it can we trust ai to make the right choices to do the right thing what about data capture etc who's who's storing the data what are they doing with it when we're interacting with ai that's another issue that you can explore in that there's plenty that you can explore this section so for topic six, you can expect a question on ethical uses, ethical impacts of technology, privacy inclusion. So we just talked about that with the AI. And you also need to be able to write about AI as well. So definitely, if you don't understand it fully, a watch of the Cold Fusion video is definitely going to help you there. So that is a run through of the advanced information. That isn't everything. I haven't covered all the questions. You need to pick out certain topics that you're going to struggle with and definitely go back and have a look at those past paper questions. Definitely go over those areas. This is a good indication of what's going to be in your paper one exam, May. So I wish you the best of luck with your exam. Please let me know how it goes. Let me know how you get on with this video down in the comments. I always like to hear from you. I'll say a big thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.